Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 30th, 2017. This is the week in charts. Of course, I want to thank you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. All right, what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. Are we in a new bull leg? Or is the end of the world? There's a lot of... Uh, Fear-mongering going on out there. A couple areas are beginning to break down a little bit. But I'm going to flesh it all out. And towards the end of the presentation, we'll get to the charts. Obviously, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. Hold off on your stock picks, if you don't mind, until we get to the live charts towards the end of the uh, slides. And then, for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time and then hit return. You can ask about 10 or 20 or more. But just make sure you hit return after you ask about each one. And again, that's for your benefit. So what are we talk about? Well, I'm going to touch a little bit about, touch a little bit more on IPOs. And then I do have a webinar later today, and I'll have some information on that for a round-the-clock trader. And I'll have that in the announcement section. Uh, I want to continue to follow up as we have been doing for weeks on the hardest, easiest thing you ever do. And basically the way, the reason I say that is because there's nothing to be done for the most part. I also want to talk about how a little discretion can go a long ways. And that'll make a lot of sense in just a few minutes. And then I want to continue to focus on can you be successful with just the basics? I've been working really hard on this intro course, as you know. And then this week I got an email from someone that pretty much said that once he went back to the basics, he became successful. So it kind of dovetails in nicely with my recent theme. So I thought I'd continue on that. Before we do that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or, as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. Okay, uh, real quick, Snapchat, big IPO, everybody's all excited about it, so I want to continue to follow up on that real quick as I have been over the last couple of weeks. And then, as I said in the intro uh, to the IPOs webinar that I did uh, recently, or I guess more specifically, the week of charts that I did recently, we talked about IPOs, I talked about how in the intro video to IPOs, I, I used the old uh, Will Rogers quote, buy stocks that go up, they don't go up, don't buy them. And obviously he's being facetious, but this applies very well to IPOs. So don't buy them unless they go up. And so forth, Snapchat really hasn't gone up much. Now, again, later today, when I do my presentation, I'm going to go back to what I did a few weeks ago in the uh, week of charts and talk about the little IPO pattern we're talking about where you have to have daylight, meaning the low is greater than the five-day moving average, and it has to be a new high. And if the high was set on day one, it would have to take out that high based on that pattern. And so far, it hasn't done that, obviously. Now, I do want to say this. It has kind of rallied up a little bit and pulled back a little bit, which it looks it looks like it's trying to bottom out a little bit. But in this particular case, since it's such a new issue, I still would use the rule that it has to take out these prior highs before I would consider it. Now, sometimes an IPO, as I talked about a few weeks ago, they, they die and die and die. They go down forever. But then they bottom out and get their act together, and then they're going to take off again, kind of like a phoenix characteristics. So that's one thing that I will trade with an IPO, and that's when they might be a year out or six months out or even three or four months out. But in a case like this, this thing is still fairly new. I wouldn't get that excited about a little bit of a bounce, a little bit of a pullback in here. I mean, if you did decide to go after it, just make sure you have a chair for when the music stops right below the low. All right, I don't want to beat the horse too much on that one because we've been talking so much about it lately. So I want to continue my discussion on following a methodology, the hardest, easiest thing you ever do. And the reason it's the hardest, easiest thing is because it's hard sometimes not to do anything, but yet that's what 
you have to do. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of discretion here that could have been used, not to um, make it a hindsight 2020 thing, but it's a, it's a reoccurring theme that I use. And then, as I often say, whenever I show discretion on a trade, use that knowledge on your next trade, and that way you can say, well, maybe it's not hindsight. Anyway, if you go back a few weeks back to February, I guess now it's more than a few weeks. Boy, where is this year going, huh? I pointed out that the portfolio, the open portfolio, that is, was looking a little weak. So on a 100K account, you were only up about $500, and that's not very impressive. Noise alone could take that out, right? But, quote is Dakota, you get a whip and I get a saw, one good trend pays for them all. So, basically, I was saying, it ain't over until the fat lady sings, right? So, following up with the portfolio once again, remember, back in February, there was a meager $500 gain. And then, as of last night, about a $5,000 gain. Now, there were some trades that have gone in and out of the portfolio since then. But I'm just following up on the ones that were in the prior screen. And this one stopped out at a loss. And this one stopped out at a small profit. But this is actually a discretionary call. But for tracking purposes and for illustration purposes of this, um, what am I trying to say? For, for illustrating this, just follow the plan, we're going to leave this one in here next week as a trade that stopped out for a small game, better than poker eye type of game. And then I'll continue to follow up on these three. We'll see what happens. Actually, it's four, right? So anyway, so far so good. So we get to say bye, Felicia, at least for now, on that. Now, if that doesn't make a lot of sense, I kind of rush through it. Uh, go back in and watch prior, go back to maybe uh, February 7th and start there, work your way back. Now, let's talk a little bit about discretion. Now, keep in mind, when you're applying dis discretion, two things. One, you don't want to throw caution to the wind. And number two, it's going to take a little bit of discipline. So if you're not disciplined, then by all means, use a hard stop and forget about it, okay? Um, if you can't watch a screen, maybe use an alert or ideally you at least want to watch the open. I would say 90% give or take a little bit of discretion is going to be right around the open because that's usually when you have to take some action. So let's talk about the open. Earlier this week, you wake up and the Trump presidency is doomed. Well, it seems like it's doomed every day, but it was really doomed because the health care bill was pulled before there was a vote. So there was a bit of a world market reaction to that. The world markets were falling apart. You come in, you turn the new screens. And I know I say don't watch the news, but I do check the futures. And usually when I check the futures, and, and you could just go to like a, a website uh, to check that, pre-market futures, so you don't have to. You don't need a quote feed or anything on that. But uh, usually there's some news that's surrounding things. So the world markets were getting hit hard. And then the futures were getting creeped. So you know it's going to suck on the open. But because we have studied the markets for years and years and years, and we read Toby Crable back in, what was it, the 80s when he wrote that book, where we talked about opening range breakouts, and we've studied all that type of stuff. So we know that a lot of times you have this big euphoria on the open where everybody kind of freaks out. But that buying or selling, I should say, often exhausts itself. And the market could actually have an open and gap reversal. So you come in and you've got to stop down here. And the market's right here the night before. And you know it's going to get whacked on the open. Okay. But again, there's always a chance for an opening gap reversal, especially when the world markets are getting creamed and the futures are getting creamed. So you know that pressure is going to follow through to the United States and to the open. So you know you're going to get knocked out on the open. There's a better than average chance you're going to get knocked out, especially because you were closing in on that stop the night before. 
So I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, but you could pull your stop, and I don't carry stops overnight, by the way. I'm often asked that. You could pull your stop and then see what happens. And if the market begins to reverse, stay with the position. Now, you have to have an uncle point in mind. I'm not sure what it's called, an uncle point. But I did have a mean uncle when I was a kid. He was like, uh, he wasn't like that much older. He was only like uh, maybe six, seven years older than me. And every day they'd give you a titty twister or something or pinch your nipple and make you try to whistle <laughs> before he let you go. So he was a mean uncle, but he's a nice guy now. See, back then it wasn't called bullying. It was just called toughening you up a little bit. But anyway, maybe that's why they call it an uncle point, you know, because he'd say, say uncle. <laughs> anyway, so... Again, it does require a little bit of discipline, and don't throw caution to the wind. Now, one other thing, keep in mind that you're giving up open profits here because we've already taken partial profits off, and if you scratch out, you scratch out, or even if you lose a little bit on this second part of the trade, overall, you still want to make money on the trade, okay? So you don't want to, again, throw the caution to the wind. All right. Let's get back to this reoccurring theme we've had lately because I've been working so hard to get this introductory course out. So can you be successful with just the basics? And last week and often I say trading is not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as many try to make it. And I see it all the time. People send me charts with a thousand indicators. People will say, hey, Dave, the stock triggered yesterday, and now it's beginning to take off. I didn't take the trade. What should I do? Hey, Dave, the stock, stock hit my stop, and now it continues to drop. What should I do? In a lot of these cases, it's cut and dry and pretty easy. So trading is not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as many try to make it. Now, this gentleman here emailed me last week. He said, you told you turned my whole trading world upside down and fixed it. Thanks, Rick. So I thought that was pretty cool. I said, hey, Rick, you mind if I quote you on that? He says, hey, go right ahead. And here's some other stuff. I was using one plan, then another, then another, then came back to the first one. I wasn't always using stops and was placing them too tight. I just didn't have the cocktail napkin, stock, entry, move, stop, target, take half, and move, stop, up, in place. Also, my money management was horrible with no idea of the risk factors. Thanks, you've made me a better trader, and thanks for the education on your website. Much success, Rick. All right, well, let's pick apart what Rick said, because this really struck a chord with me because it dovetails nicely into my whole theory that you could go a long ways with just the basics. Now, you will need some experience. I was at Traders Expo and, and uh, my long session, and one guy was kind of shaking his head a little bit and said, well, it's, it's kind of arbitrary. And I'm like, well, not exactly, because you can recognize a pattern such as a persistent pullback and a TKO, and it's not that arbitrary. And setting a stop is not that arbitrary, because you know that the range is a certain amount, as we'll see in one second, and you want to be outside of that normal range, the normal noise of the market. But yes, it will take a little experience, but as we discussed last week, you certainly will avoid some really bad mistakes by just following the basics, okay? So, like Rick said, he was following one system and then another, And I see that all the time, and, and I was guilty as charged early by trading. I was chasing systems. In the few years of doing that, I finally came to my senses. And I remember I was talking with somebody on the phone. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, I'm long this market as a commodity or something. Well, why are you long that? Well, I, I just, I'm trading this pattern. I'm not going to say who it is because I don't want to, I'm not going to say whose pattern it is because I don't like the pattern. But anyway. I'm like, oh, when did you learn that? He's like, yeah, about 10 minutes ago. I just read it in a book. So it's like, wait a minute. you you got to give yourself some experience. And, and he was trading something completely different the day before. Now, from my course, I talked about 
how Bruce Lee once said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And a corollary to that when it comes to trading would be from Linda Rasky, who says, all you need is one pattern to be successful. Now, in the course, I talk a lot about coming back to the beginning and the, the T.S. Eliot quote, and John Bollinger said the true enlightenment uh, comes when you uh, return to the beginning, or, you know, all that type of T.S. Eliot kind of stuff. I showed my wife that, and she's like, eh, I don't get it. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm thinking to myself, should I pull this out? Does it make any sense? And the more I thought about it, the more sense it made. It's like when you finally reach a point where you peel off all those indicators and recognize that there is no perfect methodology, that just following the trend, and it should be an obvious trend, is a thing to do. And in some cases, if you're a little bit more advanced, an obvious trend transition, throw those patterns in too once you get the basics down. And then somewhere along that time, I came along this Curtis Faith quote, it takes a lot of time and study before one realizes just how simple trading is, and it is. But it takes many years of failure before most traders come to grips with how hard it can be to keep those things simple and not lose sight of the basics. Amen, my brother from another mother. So as I often talk about, we all seem to go on this trader's journey, and I flesh this out in a lot more detail. I'm just kind of give you a thumbnail sketch of this, this trader's journey type of thing, this T.S. Eliot type of returning to the beginning line of reasoning. But I do remember that when I first started out, I plotted a blank chart. And then I started adding indicators and indicators and indicators, and then it got hard to see the price. And I actually, at some point, would take the price out and just look at a whole bunch of indicators. And if you think about it, an indicator is a second derivative, and it's going to have lag as such. So if you want to know where a market is headed, first look at price, and then use those indicators as illustrators. But like many of us, I added more and more indicators. And then at some point, I began to study the complex and the arcane, looking for that holy grail. And some people get stuck in this place right here. Now, if you're academia, academia, is that a word? If you're into academics, that's fine. Enjoy yourself, okay? But if you want to trade actual markets, you're going to get in a lot of trouble here. I don't want to digress too far. Imagine that, me digress. But one of my reoccurring themes, a mantra, if you will, of mine, is that everything works better with trend. It's kind of like blue bonnet, you know, everything tastes better with blue bonnet on it, right? I think I wrote a blog on that one day. But everything does work better with trend. Now, I saw, or I had seen, I should say, my wife always corrects my tense. And I say, well, i got editors for that. She's like, well, when you're speaking, you don't look like an idiot. It's like, okay. <laughs> Point taken. But what I've seen is that I've seen some people do some pretty amazing things with some of these arcane things, okay? But then subsequently blow up because that arcane method was in line with the trend. Okay, but as soon as that arcane method started saying the trend will continue or the trend must continue and there's going to be a new wave down and then the market began to turn, remember, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is is, right? They begin to lose a lot of money because their arcane method keeps calling for that new leg down and a new leg up has begun. So I think we all have to go through this journey. Some of us get stuck, and some of us could get stuck for a very long time somewhere in here. But the true enlightenment comes, again, that T.S. Eliot stuff, you know, when you reach the beginning, when you come back in at the beginning, when you remove those indicators and get back to just a blank chart. Is it going up? Is it going down? Or is it going sideways? Now, I know I beat the dead horse in this. But many, many, many people make it far more complex than it has to be. Rick went on to say, I wasn't always using stops and was placing them too tight. 
Now, keep in mind, stop placement is an art and a science, as the gentleman pointed out in New York. It can be a little arbitrary. But there's a few things for starters. It must be outside of the normal noise of the market, as I've preached a thousand times, and probably will a thousand more. There's a popular method out there that says that we should all use an 8% stop. Well, I'm not watching the screen right now. I'm doing the webinar. But I guarantee you, some of my stocks today have probably already moved 8% today alone. So depending on the stocks you're trading, it can almost, you can almost guarantee yourself a loss by using an 8% stop. And as I often say, that's like saying we should all wear a medium-sized shirt. That's something my fat ass hasn't done since I was five years old. But if you're inside this normal noise, again, of the market, you're going to get stopped out. Now, I know it could be a little arbitrary, but with a little experience, you should be able to see what that normal noise is. And common sense is your best ally. If you want to use something like average true range, people say, are oh, your stops based on average true range? I'm like, no, but yeah, sort of. But I'm eyeballing it. I'm not actually applying, applying that indicator. If you want to experiment with that, fine, okay? Use that indicator as a tool to help you. Okay, and not as something in and of itself. And be careful when you try to go too mechanical with it. But just use common sense. If a market is bouncing around four and five points, let's say four or five points a day, well, if you use a one-point stop, a two-point stop, a three-point stop, you're going to get stopped out on noise alone. And I know I've said this a thousand times, but I'll say it again for emphasis. I've helped out a lot of people. They call me up, Dave, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm losing a lot of money. Keep getting stopped out. It's like, okay, well, let's look at your stock pick. You know, those are good stocks. Well, your stops are too tight. Now, the looser your stop is within reason, the more trends you're going to catch. So I think it was back in 1999, I wrote an article, The Myth of Tight Stops. And the reason I wrote that is that tight stops seem to be universally preached. And then that was early in my public career when I had the, the luxury of being able to talk to a lot of people. Margin call. And then through talking to these people, I saw many times their stops were just too tight. And by simply loosening up the stops a little bit to put them outside of the normal volatility of the market, they were able to catch more trends. And that's all that was required. Now, when you do go to set that initial stop, and this is not going to be a, a complete lesson in and of itself. I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of a thumbnail here. You have to ask how volatile the stock is. So the more volatile a stock, as the volatility increases, your stop percentage is also going to increase. But again, eyeball it. Okay, if it's moving around, let's just say 10%. If it's bouncing up and down 10% a day, well, you're going to need more than a 10% stop if you're going to ride up that short-term volatility. Now, speaking of short-term, as I say quite often, you can only predict the short-term when it comes to markets. And our goal is to first ride out a swing trade, okay, and then also loosen that stop gradually after we take partial profits, and often that's by not doing anything, okay, to ride out a longer-term trade. So how volatile is the market you're trading? How long are you going to be in the market you're trading? Okay. So along the lines of volatility, again, getting back to the noise, where would your stop have to be to survive the short-term noise of that market? And then also, now there's quite a few patterns that I show here, but let me just give you one example. You also have to ask yourself, where would you be wrong if you take a position. Now, one pattern that I like is first breakout. I'm sorry, first pullback after base breakout. So you've got a nice little base. Let's say a stock breaks out, begins to pull back a little bit, and you get long as, remember, waiting for that uptick in here, or uptrend to resume. So if you get long on an entry, and that stock subsequently turns around and comes back into the base, then that negates this whole action here, okay? Along those lines, let's say a market comes down, bottoms out, begins to take off, pulls back, okay? If this market turns around and goes back down to new lows, then this new trend is negated, 
you have to get out. So where would you be wrong? Now, where's this? What do you say about the cocktail napkin? He talked about the cocktail napkin. Let me see if we can find that real quick. Talk amongst yourselves. So he says, I just didn't have the cocktail napkin. Stop, entry, move, stop, target, take one half, and move, stop, up, in place. So he identified that one simple thing. Now, as I've often say, as I often say, I should say, you should be able to describe a trading system on a cocktail napkin. So this is what... This is where Rick is coming from. Now in this graphic I show obviously a trend. You want to buy after a pullback as that trend begins to resume and set a stop in case you're wrong. Now the only thing that Rick pointed out was in my cocktail napkin that I did not put in was the take partial profits and trail that stop higher if the trend continues. So let me just show you my nutshell screen real quick. So we're looking for a strong trend. Now this is for existing trends. Emerging trends a little bit more trickier, but same sort of reasoning, except that the strong trend would be called an emerging trend. We're looking for a correction in that trend. We're looking to enter if and only if that trend begins to resume. If it doesn't resume and the market implodes, no ticky, no trading, right? We're going to place a protective stop in case we're wrong. And then as that market moves in our favor, we're going to stair step the stop higher. We're going to take partial profits, and that's going to be one half at the initial profit target, which is actually the initial risk plus the entry. And I've done plenty of webinars on that, so you can go in and watch those. Just uh, go to my YouTube channel and type in money management, and you'll get plenty on that. And then... By the time we take partial profits, we make sure that stop is bumped all the way to break even. So the worst that could happen, barring overnight gaps, is we scratch on the position. And then as the position moves more and more in our favor, we make that transition to longer-term trader by gradually widening the stop, often by not doing anything. Okay, Let's say the market goes up a little bit more. Well, I'll just leave you stop where it is, and then it's widened out by that small amount. So again, we're making that transition over to longer term trading because that's where the money is. Also, my money management was horrible with no idea of risk factors. Now, this was a chart I showed recently, I think the week I got back from New York for Traders Expo. And back in Traders Expo, I'd left it in from a presentation I've done a few months prior when we were still long this stock, but you can't see it because of scaling, but this was a very nice move and a pullback and an IPO. And then it began to take off really nicely. But point was that this should be very easy to recognize. And somebody pointed out, well, Dave, that stock subsequently, yeah, subsequently imploded. And I'm like, yeah, right, you are. But it was a profitable trade. Not much to write home about, but better than a poke in the eye, okay? And this is how it turned out. And this is what happened. We got stopped out for a profit. So what? Move on. Pat yourself on the back. Be happy about it. Never be depressed about giving up open profits and stopping out at a profit overall. It comes to the territory, okay? Um, who was it once said? Uh, he's, he was with Dorsey and Wright. I can't, I can't think of his name on the fly. Uh, but he was talking about he was talking about relative strength, and uh, I said, well, as often notice, a lot of times relative strength ends badly. So by relative strength, I'm saying, okay, you're buying the strongest stocks, and unfortunately, when things turn, it gets pretty ugly quickly. And that kind of goes for trend following in general. When the trend ends, it's it's no longer your friend, right? So I asked him. I said, hey. Um, 
one thing I've noticed and I haven't been able to solve for, and if I could ever solve for it again, uh, you know, getting back to my little saying earlier, you'd never see my fat ass again. <laughs> and uh, he kind of smiled for a second and looked over at me, kind of cocked his head sideways and said, uh, he goes, well, Dave, if you have a baby, you're going to have a lot of baby poop. Now, babies are great and they're nice and they're fun and they're really cool, right? But you're going to have a lot of baby poop. So it comes to territory. So giving up some of those open profits comes with the territory. It just is what it is. Okay, I got my wife wanted chickens, so now we have chickens. Okay, you got chickens. Uh, a rooster is going to come crow outside of your door on occasion while you're recording your introduction to trading course. If you get bored, go to my YouTube channel. I, I put up something about that. I think it's kind of funny. You're also going to have a lot of chicken poop. So we let our chickens free range. We have some really good eggs. They weigh a ton. They're orange. They're just absolutely delicious. But we also, every day, I got to wash the chicken poop off the front porch, you know. Comes with living in the country. Comes with having chickens. Anyway, so if you're going to trade relative strength, momentum, you're going to have to deal with some of these nuances, and there's no getting around it. But if you're willing to embrace them, even when things end badly, as all trades eventually will, by the way, sometimes you're able to come out unscathed. Now, I did a mark to market based on last night's close on this one. And assuming that you use no money management whatsoever, well, you'd have lost 30, I'm sorry, you'd have lost 70% on this position. So that's over a 6K loss. Now, that's on a 100K account. So that's a 6% loss on your overall account. And if you look right here at the low here, you would have been down a lot more than 6K. So it turned out to be a profitable position thanks to money management. And yeah, you gave up some of the profits in the end, but so what? It would have turned into a losing trade. So instead of making, oh, I don't know, $1,300 round numbers, somewhere thereabouts, you'd have lost at least $6,000 of the trade. And one thing that's not shown here is, let's say that, um, this might be a moot point because I don't know if this is marginal, but let's say this $6,000 loss, and it, it, let's say the stock was marginal, and you had a $6,000 loss, and you happen to be leveraged up on some other positions, then that could have wreaked havoc on the remainder of your portfolio. And not to even mention the psychological feeling of getting caught in a move like this. Now, sooner or later, you will get whacked, but if you're using proper money management, you'll survive the fight another day. It will happen, okay? And then in some cases, I got an email last week from somebody who was caught up in that debacle. I forgot which stock it was, but it just got like, whacked overnight like 40 percent and he's like well i already have a 40 percent loss i might as well just see what happens around the open and then it opened and made a major reversal the next day it went up like 70 80 percent i forget what stock that was i meant to talk about it but i forgot about it anyway that's a little discretion that's a little damage control my cage just slipped out Did you hear that it went damage i said a little damage control because it was bad <laughs> People say, I don't know you're a cage. I was like, yeah, it slips out every now and then. Anyway, um, so a little damage control sometimes in these uh, debacle situations can, can save your butt. But more often than not, a little money management would save you your butt too. So this trend began to uh, began to correct, and then it, would turn out, it turned out to be a little bit more than a correction. So a stop in this case would have taken you out. So as I said last week, it's not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as most people try to make it. And a captain obvious thing is all you have to do to profit from a trade is capture a trend. You have to sell a market higher than you buy it. Okay. Well, if a market goes from A to B and you have a profitable trade, B minus A obviously is your profit. From A to B, connect the lines, connect the dots. That's a trend. Okay. So why not trade trends all the time? Now, you can't have a hero. You can't be a hero. You can't have an ego. Like I said last week, 
I pointed out that somebody has called about 30 or 40 tops <laughs> since last November. And then in this last slide, they're like, you see, I'm right. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> you obviously aren't putting money on the line because you would be broke by now. So don't have a big ego and don't try to be a hero. Don't try to look smart. You know, they call me what? The trend following moron. And then I promise to take this slide out, but I just can't. I'm having a hard time getting over this. But you go back to Mr. Ackman's trade. He started buying back here, and he actually caught a pretty good trend. I think this was about a 60% move. Because of the scaling, it's kind of hard to see. But this was a tremendous trade, and it was with the trend. And longer-term trend was also up. So it was a fantastic trade initially, and with a little money management, he would have saved at least $4 billion, maybe would have made a billion. So did I do that? <laughs> All right, I believe Mr. Ackman alone. I'm sure he's uh, suffered enough. It just makes for such a good example, though. Why fight the tread and why have an ego? It's a very humbling business, okay? Forget about your ego. Check it at the door. Now, you're going to need, keep the questions coming. I'll get to them in one second. I want to finish up these few slides. So, again, you don't need a methodology. Start with something simple and build. Learn how to draw big blue arrows on your chart. Do something like a TKO or something. Maybe like a TKO within a persistent trend. So, as this gentleman pointed out, well, that's somewhat arbitrary. But when you see a chart looks like this, it should not be arbitrary because you had a very substantial net-net move, meaning that just, well, look at the close here and look at the close here, connect the dots, okay? That's a pretty impressive run. And then draw a line through as many bars as possible. That's also known as persistency. Mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression, but you know Big Dave, he likes to keep it simple. And then look for a pullback or a knockout type of move. In this case, it was pretty obvious. The stock sold off really hard. So we've got this great trend in place. Draw your big blue arrow. In this case, I guess it's red. Okay, is it a persistent trend? Yes. Does the stock tend to go up day after day after day? Yes. Is the stock accelerating? Well, that's a little hard to see, but this was a more gradual trend back here. So it was accelerating based on this move. And also, in more recent times, if you draw a trend line under these bars, you can see that it began to go a little bit parabolic here. So it's clean, it's persistent, it's accelerating, and not enough time to get into too much today. But this is something that I've spent a lot of time talking about in the intro course. And again, it amazes me how simple concepts work so well. Are there wide range bars in the direction of the trend? Okay, and again, is it accelerating? Is it persistent? Is it clean? Well, to me, this should this should hit you over the head. It's like being hit over the head with a halibut, you know? If I still have that graphic in here from last week. Now, and again, once you get a little more experience, something like a bow tie can help you in emerging trends. And I'm not going to get into that today because we've talked about it so much before, but I have a... I have a free report. If you go down to my store, I make you walk through the gift shop. You have to walk through the gift shop, but at the end of the page, they have the free report. So download the one on bow ties if you don't know what that is. Now, you're also going to need a little money position management, and we just talked about that. And as I preach, money management will cure a multitude of sins. So... When you're going to set your stop, you have to ask yourself, again, where are you wrong as a trend follower? And just get out, okay? That's the first question you have to ask yourself. You're following a trend. Okay, I'm getting this trend here because I want that trend to continue. And at some point, you have to recognize that the trend has ended and get out. And again, you'll need a little psychology going in the battle is often from within. I got my pogo book in. I'm going to have it framed and put on the uh, put on a wall. My wife, let me get this straight. Do you want me to frame this book? I'm like, eh, I'll handle it. Never mind. We have met the enemy and he is us. You know, this freshman psychology we're in its ugly head when it comes to trading. And as I said last week, a week before, and quite often, 
Livermore said it the best. A stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes, and he knows that he is making them. And again, you know what you're doing wrong? Well, you know what you're doing wrong. And I know I say this every week, but usually if somebody calls me up in frustration, I'm thinking, how am I going to figure out what they're doing wrong? It's, it's weird. You would think that I would, I would have actually paid attention to one of my webinars. So I ask, and they'll go, well, I'm not honoring my stops. All these things that Rick pointed out that he wasn't doing, that he is now. And so again, like the old doctor, doctor joke, the solution is simple. And we're talking about trading psychology, obviously. Just don't do that, okay? So once again, can you be successful with just the basics? And I say yes. And a lot of times you could do better than the gurus who've called 40 tops since November and egotistical money managers who hold on at no cost and probably pyramided down into that piece of copper light. So the way you do that, start with one pattern and build. Just trade persistent pullbacks, maybe with TKOs or some combination thereof. Be a lover, not a fighter, meaning follow the trend, okay? Uh, and by the way, in order to follow the trend, you must first have a trend to follow, okay? Now, you guys are probably rolling your eyes right now, by now. But when we get to the live charts... You're going to see a lot of things, and I hope maybe I'm, maybe I'm setting myself up for failure here. But you'd be surprised how many people are going to ask questions about stocks. You don't believe, if it doesn't happen this week, go back last week, week before, and the week before that. But you'd be surprised how many people ask questions about stocks that aren't in trends, that look like electrocardiograms, Okay that haven't made a significant move on a net-net basis in a long, long time. And the list of sins go on and on, and those are just simple little things that you can look at before trading a chart. Again, it brings you back to the basics. Now, I did get heavily into psychology where I talked about why people deal in mediocrity, and the reason is because a lot of professionals are trained as Dr. J pointed out, to deal with whatever train wreck comes along. They can't just sit there in the office and wait for the perfect client or the perfect patient or the perfect car that's easy to fix to come along. Plan your trade, trade your plan, see that all the time. As I said earlier, hey, Dave, you told us to get in at 640, stock triggers, it's at 840. What do I do now? Hey, Dave, you told me to put a stop in at 10, stocks at 6. What should I do now? list goes on and on. Plan your trade, trade your plan. Why do people not trade? Why do people not plan their trade? Because the moment you plan your trade, you have to admit that you could be wrong. We don't like admitting that we could be wrong. Why do, why do people not trade the plan? Well, well, it's more fun to wing it. Okay? The moment you take that stop, you have to admit you're wrong. Okay? The moment you take that partial profit, you have to realize that two things will happen. One, you're going to give up some open gains and get stopped out of the scratch on the remainder. Two, the stock's going to take off, and that would be an ideal situation. You ride out of trend for a long, long time and make a lot of money. But you can't say, well, I wish I'd have held on to the whole thing so I'd have made even more money. And if it completely reverses that to swing trade profit once you take it off and stop shot as a scratch, you can't say, oh, well, I wish I would have hung, I wish I'd have dumped the whole position. Okay? As I often preach, you can't put yourself into a state of regret. But if you just get used to planning your trade and trading your plan, I know it's cliche, it's easier said than done, then your life's going to get a lot easier. And then you will accept the things such as you might get stopped out as a scratch. You won't have a big, huge position on if the trend does continue, but at least you'll make a decent amount of money, some of which you will have to give up in the end. It's like having chickens or a baby. You're going to have a lot of poop, okay? <laughs> you have to deal with it. And then, of course, you want to risk a maximum of 2% work up to that amount. I mean, one thing that I spent a lot of time talking about Keep in mind, it's a basics course, but there's a lot of things that people need to rehear. 
you don't want to trade a quarter percent, a quarter percent, a quarter percent, be profitable in three trades in a row, feel like you're God, and then trade two percent and get whacked, okay? And then have to claw your way back up. So trade a, trade at a very small size, but work your way up to that two percent and be consistent throughout. So once you become successful at a quarter percent per trade, trade half percent per trade. Once you become successful at a half percent per trade, keep on slowly increasing that until you get to 2% maximum. And then again, don't be a hero. Don't have an ego. Okay? I'm uh, self-deprecating a lot of times, but that was a bit of an epiphany for me. Maybe I am a trend-following moron just following along. You know, I don't want to get too far out there being a little spacey or anything, but I'm, I was reading uh, Tools of the Titans. If you haven't read it, um, I, I, I skipped to the, the, the back of the book, and I've been reading that first. I haven't read all the health stuff and everything else, but I'm in the motivational wealth part or whatever he calls it, and it's a, it's a very worthy read. I need to get my Amazon links back up so I can put these on my website when we talk about them. But one of the things they mentioned in there was like an out-of-body experience that somebody has when he's doing his work. And it made me feel good because sometimes I talk about that. I know it sounds weird, but sometimes I have an out-of-body experience when I trade. It's kind of like, oh, I should be out of this trade because the stock's been hit. And before you know it, I exit the trade. And I'm like, what just happened? And it takes me a while to think. Like, oh, I exited the trade. Okay, well, then I could get on with my life. Um, if it's time to take profits, I don't contemplate my navel like I once did. I just take the profits, okay? Now, some cases, if it's blown through the profit target, I will squeeze out a little bit more profits. But as a general statement, I want to follow that plan as closely as possible. And a lot of times, following that plan means that I'm doing things and don't even realize I'm doing them, Okay. And one thing that helps tremendously, and I want to thank you guys for that, is having this educational business. So I'm constantly reminded of what not to do. And then it's also, I don't want to be the plumber with the bad pipes, you know. So it's like, I, I'm going to have to honor my stops. I'm going to have to take those partial profits. I'm going to have to trail that stop higher because I don't want to be a hypocrite. My wife came in my office once and said, hey, babe. Good news, i got a bunch of profitable positions on. I don't know what to do. She goes, well, what would Dave Landry do? I'm like, oh, shit, she's right. All right, a couple of announcements real quick. I am doing a webinar for Around the Clock Trader Online this afternoon. I'm going to talk about the breakout pattern in the IPOs mostly that I talked a lot about a few weeks back. So join me. Uh, it's actually uh, on right now. And uh, I don't have a link for you right uh, on the fly here, but I'll put a banner. I'll put this banner out on my website after the show, so you can go there, or you just Google bleh, Google Round the Clock Trader, and you can find today's webinar. And I think it's uh, I think I go on about 12:30 Central, 1:30 Eastern time. I have to double check that, but it's about an hour after this webinar is done. Um, I'm still rolling out the learning management system. It's been really slow, but it's finally starting to come together. I'm pretty excited about that. I have room for a couple of more beta tests if you're interested. We've we found a few problems here and there, but we're working through them. But overall, it's uh, it's it's been a pretty cool thing. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, so the beginner's course, which is part of that, is uh, I hope to start rolling that out. I don't want this to be a perpetual thing, but hopefully – Next week, I'm going to take a look at everything on Friday and try to map it out, but hopefully early next week. And the first four videos will be uh, available for free. If you want a sneak peek at those, uh, if you go to members login here, there's a little lead uh, box at the bottom or whatever you call those things. That's what uh, my um, theme calls it. But you put your name in that and... Um, when I start rolling that out, you'll be the first to get the first four videos. And again, we could probably use a few more beta testers. So you'll be brought to a screen where you'll be asked about beta testing. If you want to do that, just continue uh, on to a contact form and let me know. Or just shoot me an email on that. 
that'll make more sense when you go to it. But if you go to the members login on my website, you'll see that. And that uh, that lead box or whatever you call it, it's going to probably come down over the next few days. So check that out between uh, maybe now and Monday. Um, I always say make sure you're under delayed service. I haven't updated the delayed service in a couple of weeks because we have a breakout pattern, which is something that I don't trade very often, but it's at an IPO, and so I'm holding off on that. And then if you have any questions, obviously shoot me an email. Okay, a couple of questions coming in. Do you consider the distance to your first target would determine your stop placement? No. Um, let me think through that. Say you want the target to be below the last pivot high to increase your chances of avoiding resistance. Okay, uh, that's a great question. Uh, it seems like on the short side, I consider it more that on the downside. So James is asking this, like when I'm looking at a position, do I consider where my initial profit target would be in the position? Now remember where your stop is going to be if you take that distance from the entry and roll it up, that's going to be your initial profit target. I don't worry about it so much on the long side, but it's a great question because your reversion to the mean move suggests that you're going to bounce up to the old highs and then that those old highs from a technical perspective could provide a little bit of resistance. Now, let me answer it on the short side because that's that's what initially comes to mind. Uh, on the short side, sometimes I'll say, man, this looks like a great short. I'll do all the math and everything. And then I'll see there's a little support down here. So it's going to have a hard time getting through this support, which is kind of the same thing I do on the upside too. But in a case like this, I'm like, okay, well, if the initial profit target is, is well above that support, and I think that, well, maybe it could, it could bust through the support on the remainder position, or at least a worst case scenario, I'll scratch out, then I'll take the trade on the short side. And I guess by the same token, if there was some overhead resistance on the long side, I'd worry about that too. But as a general statement, it seems to show up more on the short term, I'm sorry, short side of the market than it does on the long side of the market. But I guess every now and then uh, I'll say, well, wait a minute, if it's way up here somewhere, way past the prior highs, you know, maybe I might uh, not take the trade. But as a general statement, usually if I really like the setup, I don't worry so much about where it might have to go. But it seems like, again, on the short side, I tend to worry about it a little bit more because usually there's uh, some sort of resistance or support, I should say, down below. This might require your stock to be a little closer to the entry. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. So James is saying um, if your stop, let's just redraw this. Probably have to start a new screen. Let's see. Why is it not working? Uh, let's see. Talk amongst yourselves. So what he's saying is that let's say you have a position that looks like this and you're thinking your stop would have to be here and you do all the math, okay, and you roll that up, it would put your profit target up here. So he's saying would you be willing to maybe tighten that stop up a little bit going in so it could put your profit target a little bit closer to the prior high. So you're catching that reversion to the mean move and you're not also dealing with the prior peak. I guess in the back of my mind, I consider this a little bit, okay, but it's not something that I could really uh, quantify. But yeah, maybe I'll say, well, if I'm way up here, is it possible I could have that stop maybe a little bit tighter? So, yeah, I think so. I think you could, you could, I mean, that's kind of a more advanced type of thing. And, you know, that's where it could get, start getting a little bit more arbitrary. But then you really have to ask yourself, are you getting within the normal noise of the stock? Usually the first thing is it's such a great 
I think you have to get past the, the, the litmus test of do you really, really love the setup? And if you really, really love the setup, you don't worry so much about something like this, like that aforementioned persistent pullback with a really nice TKO. It's just such a perfect textbook setup. But anything less than a textbook setup, yeah, I hear you a little bit. You might have to noodle with it a little bit to determine where your stop should be and if that if that uh, initial profit target would be right around the prior highs, et cetera. Okay. Keep in mind, by the way, I don't want to digress too far, but like if you're trading like a TKO pattern, your entry will be close to that prior high, and you're not really going to get that reversal to the mean move. But that's a different type of pattern. You're basically looking for this blow-off move to continue. Don't all uptrends deal with higher peaks? Well, yeah, eventually, you know, uh, it's a market is, you know, it should start, it should not start making lower peaks, okay? You know, this good, this bad. Yeah, so what's the point on that? I, I, where are you going with that, uh, Craig? So can we get the F out of the way then? Why fear prior highs? Oh, um, you know, I don't. I don't if, um, and maybe here's a way to flesh it out. Number one, I don't fear the prior highs if I really, really like the setup. Number two, maybe if it's a deep pullback, okay, maybe I might consider hopefully getting that profit target out before the prior high. But I hear what you're saying. You're right. So if it's something like this, a TKO type of pattern, I'm not worried about the prior highs. If I really like the setup, I'm not worried about the prior highs. Okay, because as Craig pointed out, higher highs, higher lows would be an uptrend. But if it's a deep pullback, ideally it would be cool if I could get my initial profit target out before the peak. That's a good question. I wasn't really a I wasn't really expecting a question require thought requiring thought today. <laughs> How far away in the past does overhead supply have to be to not be a threat when taking a position? Uh, Elvis, that's a long answer to that. Uh, let's see if we could uh, get a blank screen again. It's kind of a long answer. So his question is, let's say you got some overhead supply, market goes down, you know, sets up, whatever. How far back in time do you have to worry about it? Well, the problem is markets have very long memories. And this is this was, I spent probably... Oh, I don't know, 50 minutes talking about just this alone in a stock selection course. Uh, but markets do have very long memories. So, yeah, some of these people will, will have been washed out with time. Some of these people uh, may have died and their estates might have been settled. Some of these people may have gotten divorced. Some of these people may have retired and said, screw the stock market, blah, blah, blah. But as a general statement, markets can have very, very long memories. So, there's really no quick answer to that, but it depends. Uh, and then the other factor you would factor in, of course, would be how far above the market is that overhead supply. If it's 100% above the market, you know what? If I could make 100% on every trade, I'd be a pretty happy camper. So if it's about 100% above, I'm not going to worry about it. But, yeah, the further back in time, the less meaningful it is. But if you've got years and years of trading around a range, it looks like that. Even if it is a couple of years back, you have to take it into consideration if, of course, it's close to where you're entering the uh, stock. All right. Now, uh, like I said, uh, make sure in delayed service, and people are wondering if they ever update delayed service. Again, that's because we had uh, some open positions that have not, some open setups that have a trigger. Yeah, Elvis, I'm sorry. I don't know if I give you a full answer on that, but um, that's kind of the quick answer. Okay, uh, let me pop out to a few charts, and then if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to start doing so now. Let's take a look at the overall market. It's kind of interesting. It's like, like we're talking about the Dow. Let's look at the Dow. I don't look at the Dow much, but let's take a look at it real quick. The Dow was down 66 points. I noticed the t on TV they were like, Oh my gosh, look at the Dow, it's down 66 points. It's, the Trump rally has ended. 
It's like, well, maybe it's ended. I don't know. I mean, can we stop calling it the Trump rally? Markets go up and markets go down. Okay. When you start attaching yourself to them like it's like you made that, that's when you have to be really careful. But I wouldn't call this the end of the world because we had a little bit of a correction in here. Let's just see what that was on a net net basis. Let's go up one day. So that's a somebody's gonna ask me as soon as I get done. Custom date sort. I just hit the C key. I don't actually follow through with the sort. This is if you want to mess around with relative strength. But you can see that's a 2% and change correction. Ooh, 2%, you know? Now, one day it will end badly. One day this trend will end. By the way, on Facebook, one of my, uh, I guess it was one of my Italian brethren, posted a cover of uh, The Economist. And there was a bull breaking out of a wall or something and said he's back. Usually that's a kiss of death. So not that you could time a market perfectly on that, but that's, I usually hate when you start seeing these, uh, these covers. And usually the end of a bear market, of course, is when they start showing bears everywhere. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. A little NASDAQ. Not bad, okay? Not doing much today, but just a smidge off of all-time highs. I guess earlier just this morning it was at an all-time closing high, okay, if it had closed there, obviously. So, so far so good there. Yeah, it's a little sideways as of late. The net net range is somewhat sideways in here. But as long as you're at or near new highs, all-time highs especially, air on the side of the longer-term trend. Write that down. Let's take a look at, just in case Phil's in here, let's take a look at his 50-day moving average. Um, I usually don't plot the 50-day simple unless the market begins to stall out a little bit then I think it could be a good point of reference. Uh, it also can help to tell you, help to indicate, not illustrate, I'm sorry, help to illustrate, not indicate the direction of the trend. Notice the slope here was up. Which way was the market headed? Up, okay. Notice there was daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than moving average, okay. Meaning that the trend was up, okay. Now we did have a little downside daylight this week, but notice the slope is pretty much flat. And if we close right around here, we'll be at or above it again. Again, nothing magical about it, but it does provide us with a good point of reference. So, Russell doing okay, but kind of sideways in here as of late. I sure would like to see it break out the new highs and not look back. Doesn't look quite as good as the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy the energies, but you can see they've improved quite a bit in more recent times, so that's kind of interesting in here. Metals and mining also look kind of dubious like the energies. They're, they're improving a little bit as of late, but not enough to get too excited about just yet. And then what else is going on within the sector? So retail came back nicely yesterday, and then today it's kind of in Flatsville, but it's kind of all over the place. And then as you would expect with the NASDAQ at or really close to all-time highs, a lot of your technology-related areas like hardware. By the way, take a, take a look at your daylight there, okay? We've had daylight there since the beginning of December, and that's been a pretty good trend. And you could actually go back all the way to November, and we didn't even have any downside daylight. So, you know, again, what, keep ama what keeps amazing me or never ceases to amaze me is how the simple, basic concepts can actually work. Whenever I talk to professionals, I'm always worried that they're going to laugh at me when I bring up some of this basic stuff. But a lot of times they're like, wow, I never thought of it like that. Or like, uh, I think it was last week I submitted a, an article to an institutional magazine, just a little one-page blurb, or a trend following. I'll put that on a website. I didn't even remember to do that. Maybe I'll put that up tomorrow. It's a proactive advisor magazine if you want to take a look at it. 
on the net. And then they added a robe. He's like, hey, I really like your article. I thought he was going to be like, you know, Phew. I guess we'll find somebody else for this segment this uh, month. But he actually liked it. It's a very simple article about just follow the trend. Just do it. Anyway, before I digress too far too late, um, technology looking pretty good. Add or near new highs, hardware, software. If you got hardware, you need software for your hardware, right? What was that movie? Really bad movie. Ishtar? And then, of course, uh, semiconductors have been doing pretty good here as of late. So far, so good. Again, there's your little friend Daylight. Nice little long, long Daylight run in that position. Nothing magical about a moving average, but it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. Um, I occasionally put in the bow tie moving averages. And notice what's kind of cool here. We've had mostly upside Daylight and certainly positive slope in a 30-day moving average, the exponential moving average, for a long, 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 long time, okay? So that's pretty cool. Let's take a look at bonds. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy bonds, but as you can see, we have a bow tie up, meaning that the moving averages come together and crossed over, okay? The 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. I would rush out and buy them because they're not at like major, major lows. Like, let's take a look at like a weekly chart. They're not like down here like they were, you know, 10 years ago, multi-year lows. They're kind of mid-range within a several-year range. But the reason I like the fact that they're bottoming out is because there was a big fear in the market of rising rates. And rates are going to rise. I mean, they've been artificially low for way too long. And that's a whole... Another argument I don't want to get into, but I think the rates have been manipulated lower for way too long, and eventually that's going to end badly. But I think we can hold off worrying about that for now, at least until and unless the bonds take out the recent loan here. This is TLT, FYI. Okay, uh, the only other thing I want to point out in the sectors is if you take a look at the banks, they're now in the process of making a bow tie down off of major, major highs. We have some shorts in the lander list coming into the day, and we have two shorts in the service coming in today. One's a bank, one's a brokerage. So financials, too, looking a little dubious in here, specifically the banks. But the brokerage are not looking so good either. But hopefully these positions will never, or these setups will never trigger. I don't mind the short side. It's not my favorite thing to do. I don't do it to try to get rich, but I do it because I'm a trader and I can make money if stocks go up. I can make money if stocks go down. But the main reason I do it is because it helps me to see both sides of the market. As I've said, a nausea, my friends who are long only money management because of the charters, they tend to be a little bit bullish. The glass is always half full. And, and I understand that. And I get that. And I'm not throwing anybody in the bus, picking on anybody. But when you see, or I should say, when you trade both sides of the market, it really helps you to see the ups and, of course, the down. Okay. All right. Let's uh, open it up for stocks here. A lot of questions coming in. Donald says, I am I Phoenix stock. I am I? I don't see it. Let me back the chart out and see what Donald's talking about. Uh, it's really, really thin, okay? And it's a penny stock. Now, sometimes you might have a higher price stock that's fairly thin. If you multiply the average volume times the price of the stock, you'll get some sort of dollar figure. But in this case, it's traded, what, 17? What's two zeros after that? It's barely trades. Um, what would that be? The new TC adds the zeros in for you, doesn't it? Is that 17,400? Okay. <laughs> I mean, that could be one trader. You wouldn't have to have that big of an account to buy a day's worth of volume in that stock. So, no, um, I would avoid this as a Phoenix stock. What he's saying is a Phoenix stock, and it's it's no defined pattern, but I call it a Phoenix stock when you have something – that makes uh, it has a fall from grace over a period of time, 
and then bottoms out and then begins to rise from the ashes. In this case, maybe a, a first thrust or a bow tie could be a wonderful pattern when that occurs. But no, Donald, it's too, uh, it's too thin. Just blow that one off for now. Rocks. R-O-X for Rick. Rocks. Um, it's just a little too wide and loose. I mean, I hear you. It's beginning to take off. It's making some new highs in here. For me to get excited about this stock based on its current wide and loose looks, it would actually have to make new highs and then possibly pull back from there before we go after. But, yeah, I would leave that one alone for now. Uh, what's this something in the P is it PME in the foods or something? Something like this would look a little bit better when you zoom it in you can see It's a more solid trend. It's up towards new air or new highs or whatever with not the, too much overhead resistance Nano N A N O N A N O Well, this looks good uh, a little bit on the thin side as you can see Volume-wise, a couple hundred thousand shares, but not super thin where you couldn't trade it. I mean, a couple hundred thousand shares, $29 a share, eh, you could probably trade that. Put that on your momentum list, but it has to pull back to set up. So, yeah, is it a trend? Yes. I would like to see a little bit more accelerated trend. I mean, this is a semiconductor, and it only has an HV of 26. That's not very high. And you can see that it's only gone about three points, or not even three points, only about two and a half points in about a month and a half. So, yeah, it's in an uptrend. Put it in your watch list. But it would have to do two things for me to buy it. Number one, it would have to begin to accelerate higher. And number two, it would have to pull back, obviously, as a pullback player. Steve wants to know about ARCO. Elvis, you're next. Well, you got a breakout here. And then now it's pushing higher again. I'm not a huge fan of trading a market with just a one-bar breakout, but you can see now it's beginning to bust out to new highs. The problem that I'm seeing now is, is somebody asked earlier, overhead supply. Yeah, this goes back a couple of years. Um, but I would I would certainly like a stock more. You know, Maybe you don't have to worry about this too much, but I certainly would like a stock more if it didn't have this overhead supply. So, yeah, if it kept going higher... Than on pullbacks, but again, I think I think you could have some some of a problem, somewhat of a problem with this overhead supply. Now maybe I'm worrying a little bit too much about that, but that's a lot of trading. You got two years worth of trading to overcome. Yeah, it probably worked its way through the system, but I think I would avoid it on that. But you know, check back in a few weeks if it continues to break out on a pullback. We'll talk about it again, but I probably would still say avoid it. Elvis wants to know about ENV as a short. Um, with the short setups, or any transitional setups for that matter, you want to look for them at the fringes. So on the short side, you want to short up here somewhere, or you want to buy down here if you were looking to buy. Let's put the moving averages in just for S&Gs. So you had a bow tie recently, and then it sold off nicely from that bow tie. Can't argue with that. Uh, but if you back the chart way out, I would much rather trade the bow tie up here, okay? And then possibly on the buy side, something down here would be a little bit more exciting. But again, you had overhead resistance here. So, yeah, I hear you. And it looks like it's in trouble. But I think if you're going to short something, short something like the banks, okay, where they're having a bit of a fall from grace type of situation, okay? See how the banks are way up here at these brand new highs, okay? And they're beginning to bow tie down. Now, of course, you want to wait for an entry. But you can see they're beginning to break down, and now they're pulling back a little bit. So if they keep going up, then you won't get triggered in, and so what? But if they begin to roll over and start making new lows after just making new highs, it's possible that a lot of people could run for the door at the same time. Um, go into my website, go to free reports or the store, and download GoGoNomo, okay? And that's where I talk about uh, 
those type of stocks. AMAT is going to be a semiconductor. Yeah, this looks good. Uh, HV is pretty low in this, uh, 17. Uh, it looks okay. You know, maybe on a pullback. It, it's, for me, I'd like to see some more acceleration higher. But, yeah, it looks okay as a stock that's trending. You know, maybe put it in your momentum list. IMOS. IMOS looks pretty good. Let's take a look at the – yeah, it's up here, new highs. Um, you know, as I often say, breakout uh, – IPOs have a breakout characteristic that makes it pretty cool. Uh, I think it'd be better to wait for this stock to pull back before looking to trade it. Let's put the five-day moving average in and just see what that uh, – I haven't named the system yet, but the, or pattern, I should say. Dave Landry's – IPO breakout moving average system. So, yeah, technically it would be triggering if it closed anywhere above this high based on this five-day system. So, yeah, good eye on that. Um, it just seems a little dangerous to, to buy it at these high levels in here. I'd almost prefer to see if it could go even higher and then play pullbacks along the way. But, yeah, if you were following that system mechanically, that setup mechanically, then by all means, yes, it would be triggering. Um, today. Let me pull this over here for a second. I got to check a few things. Um, I need to, I forgot to write down my Landry list. I'm getting some questions about some stocks that I'm familiar with. Yeah, uh, th that one's on the Landry list, unfortunately. So uh, who's asking about that one? Brett. Yeah, Brett, absolutely. Brett, you're, you're on my... <laughs> Brett, are you in the service? Brett's asking about every stock that I recommended for today. Very good, Brett. Good eye on that. So, yeah, we can't talk about that one out of, out of courtesy of um, my people in the service. Okay? So, yeah. Those, but those are both pretty good. And, yes, to, to your answer about that one being a breakout, absolutely. Okay. Hey, Hank, how you doing? Good to see you. That's a good-looking stock, Hank. Let's uh, take a look at this. Um, from a momentum standpoint, it looks pretty good. Um, maybe on a pullback. I mean, ideally, I'd like to see it kind of bang out some even more new highs. But absolutely, put that on your, um, put that on your watch list. <laughs> Brett says, ha-ha, I wish I could, but I'm not on your service. Well, well, good job. I mean, you picked out... Those were our two longs for today, so congratulations. Good job on that. I'm impressed. TESS for Mr. Jim. Um, I'd like to see it clear this prior high more decisively. And then, you know, you ask it about overhead supply. It's going to have a hard time. You know, you got some back here, some back here. It's just going to have a hard time moving higher. So I would find something with clear air above. And leave that one alone. And, you know, for that, you, you're trying to make something happen. Now, sometimes I'm a perfectionist almost to a fault when it comes to stocks, but you're much better off, I think, trying to just pick the best of the best. Now, this one does have some overhead supply, but it's up around 20 something bucks a share, so let's not worry too much about that. Um, who asked about this? Andre likes these little volatile ones, and I can't blame him. Uh, yeah, I'd like to see some, ideally some follow-through to the upside, maybe on a pullback, but ideally I'd like to see some follow-through. It's not set up, but you certainly want to put it on your uh, watch list. Yeah, this one looks okay, too, and again, it's going to have to pull back to set up, but yeah, put that on your watch list. Uh, oh, it's got some problems back here. I don't, I don't like this big gap, so yeah, scratch that one. TSCO is a short. Uh, no. See, we talked about that middle of the range problem. You know, I'd much rather short a stock. Let's put the bow ties in to give you a reference. I'd much rather short a stock like after a bow tie way up here. Again, read that aforementioned Gogo Nomo report. Okay. Now, this one's a little squirrely, so you can argue that, well, this might not have been the best short in the world. 
but obviously it kind of fits in the in the thinking at least of the go go no go you find a stock at high levels ideally something that's uh, fairly thick and a stock that would actually have fundamentals so you're not shorting like a crazy biotech and it could be priced for perfection when it begins to crack and right now banks fit that bill if you guys you guys are in the service or if you want to go on a delayed service go back and look, look at the archives go back and look at early 2016 we were short in the banks really heavily such as OZRK banks like that some financials I think um, I want to say MOH but that's not a financial there was a couple other ones in there but they're come they were coming off of like OZRK is set up again now but see, look back at 2016 and get under delayed service. Go in and look at these archives, and you'll learn a lot. I mean, I know it's kind of uh, not it's well, it's a little egotistical to say that, but I want you to see that when I tell you to short a stock coming off of all-time highs after a bow tie, I don't want you to think that I'm just looking at this stock in hindsight and going, "Ooh, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have shorted it back here." Well, I did short it back here. So go in and look at the service archives. And you'll see these kind of things. And then now it's once again, you've got that kind of setup. And this is kind of like the go go nomo type of thing. So I'll throw you out a freebie this week. Um, you know, this would be a short maybe below 50 bucks a share. Okay. Put it a stop at brand new highs if you want. And that way you know you're wrong. What did we say earlier? Where would you be wrong? Okay. So short it here, put a stop up here. Go uh go on vacation. Wait for an entry, though. Massey. I think Elvis asked about that one. All right, let's take a look at this. Let's see if we get the chart cleaned up. Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting, but it didn't... I'd almost like to see... See, last week I got this little line drawn in. I almost would have preferred to see more of a knockout move. It's got, it's got all the makings of a, of a pretty good setup in here. But I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move based on the magnitude that's running here. So now I think I might pass on that one. I think I would just leave it in my momentum list unless it has a big knockout bar. But then after that, the problem is you're getting too many days in the pullback. Phil wants to know about A-A-O-I-T-K-O. -O. That sounds familiar. Yeah, this is one that's in my watch list. You, see, you can see my watch list in the background right here. Um, I wouldn't trade this as a TKO because it really didn't clear this prior high decisively. You know, a while back, it looked pretty good as a pullback about a week or so ago, but it really hasn't taken it out. So I would let it take out that prior high decisively and then pull back. I think that was on the Landry list for a while. Seabay is going to be a volatile one. Not as bad as I thought. Well, HV88. Yeah, again, Andre, this would have to make new highs. But by all means, put it on your momentum list. And look, Big Dave has it right here. I always hate when I show this because I know you, I know not you, but I know some people are looking at the list and calling off the list. CCMP for Howard. Uh, yeah, this needs to go on your momentum list, but... Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more acceleration higher, but yeah, it's certainly pretty good. You know, uh, let me know in the first pullback, and we'll we'll take a look at it. Okay. DVMT. And by the way, if you're new to the show, and I'm and it seems like I'm picking it. Somebody said that a while back. I never like anything to point out. Well, you know, it's not my way or the highway. I'm just trying to show you from a trend follower's perspective what I look for. Uh, in this case, kind of sideways. Obviously, longer term uptrend. Wait. Wait to see if it could break out and then play a pullback like the pattern I showed earlier in the uh, in the slides. Don wants to know about DPLO. I'm going to have to go into uh, lightning around here. I don't like this big gap down that it's dealt, dealing with. Um, I have found that you had a lot of people got stuck with this stock. Okay, Kind of like the Novin would be a good example in more recent times too. Uh, and they might be looking to bail out. Even if you have a great look at setup over here, you're going to have people that got sucked into this or, or just didn't bother getting out before it began to implode. So I would leave, I would leave that one alone. It's just not worth it. There's too many clean stocks out there right now to go 
after something like that. Massey looks like Kim. We're long, Kim. Um, but David's going sideways. Well, we're in longer term trend following mode. So what if it consolidates, it goes up again, you know? Uh, go sideways, go up, go sideways, go up. Kind of Darvis box style, rinse and repeat. Fine with me. Massey? Yeah, I hear you. It looks a little bit like Kim, but I would like to see more of a knockout move on that one. I hear you, Craig. I mean, good eye for sure. Fuel, yeah, fuel's going straight up. I know one of you guys said fuel last week. Um, here's the thing, um, and I was talking with somebody on this. It probably was Phil, because Phil and I kind of go back and forth. We kind of noodle around with some market talk, system talk, and all. A while back, it just became too much work for me. And because I just never going to do anything with it. I had a fund that was looking at it once, but um, he wasn't. He didn't like the volatility very much, and then I don't think he really wanted to be a fund manager anymore anyway, but that's a long story, endless. But the Landry 100 used to be, and, and I no longer track it, but I used to track the 100 stocks that I liked that were making new highs, usually like an expansion of range or something. I would put stocks into the uh, Landry 100, and it actually worked very well, but and I actually learned a lot, too. That's where I really noticed that, boy, when momentum gets hit, it gets hit hard. Um, the Landry 100, which was 100 momentum stocks that were making new highs, uh, would get whacked, like sometimes the day before the market would tank. So it was, certainly was not an exercise in futility, but it was a hard, uh, a lot of work to maintain. And I spend probably... 30, 40 minutes a day working on that, and it was a great exercise, and I learned a lot, or relearned a lot, or confirmed a lot in the process. But if you were running a, a, a portfolio where you could buy 100 stocks at a time, then by all means, just go out and buy new highs, okay? The problem is, if you're running a small private for portfolio where you only can maybe buy 5 to 10 stocks, then it's going to be hard, a little bit harder to get those few stocks that take off but if you're if you're say you had a portfolio at one percent total dollar value into each stock like a huge fund then i think you could actually do quite well just buying new highs okay so that's a case where somebody asked about fuel last week and i'm like eh, i don't like it it would have to you know say you take off and pull back and then of course it took off it was you all right it was craig so craig you bought it cool yeah, you know, and that's a, that's a tough thing to do. I mean, I've I've been around some people who, uh, you know, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but publicly they're kind of like they, they talk about all these complex systems, and then you you get to visit them in his off in their office, and it's like you'll see that they're actually just pretty much buying stocks that are making new highs. It's amazing sometimes that even people who who seem a little bit more complex <laughs> in their public life are doing something that are some things that are far more simpler. And again, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. Um, it seems to be working for them, but yeah, what you see is what you get with me. Um, these are the patterns that I show you, the patterns that I actually like, the patterns I actually trade. There's nothing secret out there. There's a few things like in IPOs that I haven't given away, like a lot of the stuff that I give away. All right, Jim wants to know about IVAC. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Uh, it looks pretty good. It's a little bumpy, but, you know, it's this is kind of like bumpiness within persistency. Maybe that's a pattern in and of itself. Notice that it swings quite nicely. The overbought, oversold swings are quite nicely within the mean, okay? And the mean is a, a nice sloping uptrend. Let's put in a linear regression uptrend just for S and Gs and see what happens. I bet it looks a lot like my line. Look at that. Almost perfect. That's cool. Yeah, that's kind of a neat pattern. Uh, so, yeah, on next pullback, looks like it's kind of like thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, rinse and repeat. So, absolutely, Jim. Good eye on that one. Dave, I noticed you have much nicer to people going to service. Well, get on the service. I'll be nice to you, too. <laughs> Jim's on the service. No, it's people in service pick better stocks, and I, I firmly believe that. Because if they don't, I beat them up a little bit, okay, until they do. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. It's making new highs. Um, has somewhat of a Phoenix characteristic to it. It's kind of all over the place, but it's kind of getting its act together. Uh, if it continues to break out, then yeah, on a pullback, absolutely, uh, Don. CC for Elvis. 
And yeah, these chemicals have been breaking out or hitting new highs, I should say, as of late. If it continues to break out, absolutely on a pullback. Howard, I own that one in my personal account, so I'm not gonna. Um, I don't want to talk about it if you don't mind. But yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> XHB. Yeah, the home builders. This is an ETF. I'm not a huge fan of trading ETFs, uh, but it looks okay. Uh, I mean, if you were running a big portfolio of ETFs, then yeah, absolutely. It's kind of broken out. It's pulled back a little bit. I mean, HV is only 14. But yeah, you could be long this and say, well, I'm going to stop myself out if it comes back into this range. Craig says, the reason I'm on the service is because everyone is treated fairly and the methodology works for me. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm just giving you guys a hard time. But yeah, I will beat you up a little bit if you're uh, on the service and you're showing me electrocardiograms. Donald, we cannot talk about that when that is the setup of the day. Good job, though. Congratulations. THO, good short, off new highs. Um, it looks okay. Usually on the short side, I like to see a short trigger within a few days of its slide. Um, this stock's in a lot of trouble. It's filled this gap back here. Uh, it looks okay. I wouldn't. I think I would focus mostly on the banks right now and the financials in general for the short side but only on a trigger but yeah this stock's in a lot of trouble um but i think you could probably find some other stocks to short inap and we're almost out of time yeah this looks kind of interesting uh, i'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout move because we really didn't get that far past this prior peak so ideally what i'd like to see is a little bit more acceleration higher and then a knockout move on that one. But yeah, put that on your uh, watch list, Howard. Okay, let's take a look at one more in here. Um, LPTH. Wow, well, that's kind of all over the place. I'm actually long this one. Oh, wait a minute. I'm thinking of someone, something else. I am not long this one, but it is all over the place. Um, the move higher is kind of extreme in here. It's up 17% today alone. Um, but see if it can continue to follow through and then maybe maybe play the pullback. But you do have that base breakout. It is pretty volatile, so be careful. Uh, but, yeah, on a pullback, I think that would be worthwhile. Absolutely. Well, look, I know we have a few unanswered ones in here. I need to go ahead and wrap things up because of the recordings and all. Plus, I have another webinar to get to. But I love doing these shows. As you know, it's a highlight of my week. Thank you guys and girls for showing up. Anything unanswered um, as a trading question in general, shoot me an email. I probably won't have time to get back to you on individual stocks based on the schedule for the next couple of weeks in here. Um, so just hold those, hold off on those until we uh, do the bleh, until we do the next uh, webinar. Uh, if we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend, and then uh, I guess we'll see you guys and girls again next week. Great show, Dave. Many thanks. See you next week. Thank you, Leon. You keep me on the straight and narrow. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Thanks a lot. Brett, God bless. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys and girls.